you so much. What an honor to have this time with all of you. And I'm just so touched that, you know, whenever, when you write a book, you, you kind of, you're just sitting there with the computer, right? And you kind of imagine that people might read it. And it is just so gratifying to think of all of you taking the time to learn and engage and participate. And, you know, I was thinking as I was coming here, I was like, well, I could tell my stories, but a lot of them are in the book. And I was like, well, that's fine. I'm sure, I'm sure it's okay if you hear a story more than once, right? Um, but um, really, um, I just want to say how important I think this moment in history is. You know, we have a food system uh, that I think is toxic, essentially, right? It's, it is systematically a fueling uh, epidemic rates of heart disease as well as cancer and type two diabetes and obesity and even dementia. And that same food system, which is reliant on processed foods and chemicals and animal products uh, and added sugars is also reliant on pesticides and hormones and antibiotics and GMOs and fungicides and toxins. You put all that together and then you look at the fact that industrialized agriculture has become the most environmentally destructive force on the planet. It's fueling the destruction of tropical rainforests, the obliteration of indigenous tribes that live there. It's fueling the depletion of our aquifers and our water supplies. You know, I live in California where we've got a drought. Well, guess what? The majority of our water isn't going to swimming pools and golf courses or toilets. It's going to agriculture. And industrialized agriculture, particularly the factory farms in our industrialized agriculture, are sucking huge amounts of water and huge amounts of land, and they're spewing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, which makes industrialized agriculture a central driver of climate change. And so what I find so exciting, really, is that with one fell swoop, by changing what we put on our knives and forks, we can help to heal our hearts. We can have more energy and better sleep, more mental clarity, and we can be there for our loved ones as we get older, knowing that, that we'll be taking care of our bodies and health. At the same time, we're helping to build a world where there's less animals being tortured in factory farms, where there's less rainforest being cut down, less water being sucked out of the ground, and there's a more sustainable world for future generations. And so to me, a food revolution is really about bringing our food choices into alignment with our values, with what we want for ourselves and for our world. And I find that incredibly empowering. And I know you all are focused a lot on heart health. So we can go there especially. And you know, some of my top mentors in this space, Dr. Dean Ornish, you all may have heard of him. Um, he was the first doctor to prove that we could not just prevent, but actually reduce, uh, excuse me, actually reverse heart disease, not just occasionally, but consistently. The lifestyle heart trial that he led in 1990 showed an 82% reduction in coronary atherosclerosis after just one year on a whole foods plant-based diet without statins or other cholesterol lowering drugs. And 82% reduction. And unlike with statins or other medications, the only side effects were good ones. Turns out the same diet that he was using for heart disease is also helpful against dementia and helping prevent it, is also helpful against type two diabetes and against various forms of cancer. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, in 1985, he was working at the Cleveland Clinic. He had 22 patients in his study who were all suffering from severe heart disease. They were all told they were untreatable with the technology at that time there was nothing that doctors could do for them. They were essentially told, here's your death sentence. You're going to be dead within a year. His 22 patients all went on a whole foods, plant strong diet and 17 of them stuck with it. And all 17 of them stopped the progression of their disease. And most of them had a reversal. A generation later, most of those 22 patients were still living. And then uh, Dr. Joel Furman published a study in which he found that when participants ate his nutritarian diet, they experienced weight loss, drop in blood pressure, lower LDL cholesterol levels, and lower tri triglycerides almost universally, almost every single person. 
So we can see that food matters. And we have massive studies. Those are smaller studies to really go in depth. And they were, they were trendsetters. The Ornish program went on to be tested in many, many environments to the point that it became the first lifestyle-based program that was actually covered by Medicare and the big insurance companies because they realized that it worked more effectively than the drugs and surgeries and far more cheaply. And again, with only positive side effects. So I, I think this is incredible. And what we're seeing is that up to 90% of heart disease can be prevented and 80% or so can be reversed just with diet and lifestyle choices. Now, interestingly, the Furman program and the Esselstyn program were just diet-based. The Ornish program has four pillars. So essentially that comes down to eat better, stress less, love more and move more. And it seems clear given that all three of them got tremendous results that diet is the central pillar. But it also seems clear that stressing less and loving more and moving more are good for our health as well. And when you put all that together, that's when you get the most powerful synergy. So what does it mean to eat better? Well, predominantly, it means basing your diet around whole plant foods, eating less sugar, less processed junk, and less animal products. And what does stress less mean? It means not that you never have stress, but that you get rid of the unhealthy chronic stress, the, the, the repetitive thoughts, the, annoying, the annoyance in your body, the place where you're just eh, all day long, right? And you find ways to calm down, to, to settle your nervous system, to bring peace and tranquility into your heart, into your consciousness. You know, everyone has their own pathway for that. You know, um, for some people it's in their faith. For some people it's in some form of meditation. For other people it's guided relaxations. For other people it's just taking some deep breaths. And uh, so bringing down the stress and bringing up the peace is good for your health. And then what, is, what does move more mean? Well, of course, it predominantly means exercise. And what we're learning is that sitting really is the new smoking. And uh, it's so every half hour or hour, if you can get up and move around, even for a minute, it really helps your body stay alive and stay present and keep your system going. And then getting some exercise where your heart's really pumping, you know, whether it's jogging or vigorous walking or some kind of sport activity or dancing or whatever it is that works for you on the regular is really, really good for your heart and your overall health. And then loving more, of course, can't forget about that because we're talking about the heart, right? There is this fascinating connection between our physical heart and our emotional heart. You know, we think of the heart and we think of Valentine's, right? And love and connection and uh, intimacy with other humans that we care about. And then we think of the physical heart as this pump in our body. And we think of them almost as if they're separate things, but there's actually a reason why we talk about opening your heart, following your heart, coming from the heart, you know, uh, doing it with heart. All of that links to the fact that your heart, that little organ in your chest is deeply connected to love and to connection. And there are studies showing us that when people have an emotional experience of opening their heart, their heart, uh, their heart rhythm settles and balances. People who are having fibrillation, sometimes it settles down when they have love in their hearts. And so um, it's fascinating and it's also interesting that one of the best indicators for health outcome is sense of intimacy and emotional connection with other human beings. In fact, uh, I think it's no exaggeration to say that loneliness can kill faster than cigarettes. Um, statistically, people who feel alone and all alone in the world statistically are unlikely to live long for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, and so you can have intimacy and love in all kinds of ways. Um, people who join bowling leagues, people who are part of senior centers, obviously people who are part of, part of church groups, you know, where they feel social connection, they feel a sense of belonging, they feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. It gives a sense of meaning and purpose to life. And, uh, and it's good for your physical heart as well. So those are the basic pillars. And we can go a lot more into food because that's my main focus, but I kind of wanted to give some, some high level here. And, um, you know, Dr. Ornish actually came out with a book a couple of years ago with his wife, Anne, called Undo It. And his core principle is 
that the same diet and lifestyle patterns that he's showing are good for preventing and reversing heart disease are actually good for all these other things too. Uh, interestingly, um, there's these regions called the blue zones. You may have heard of them where people live the longest, healthiest lives traditionally, in Okinawa, Japan, and uh, Vilcabamba in Ecuador. There's actually one, uh, there's one in Greece. There's actually one in the United States. It's in Southern California. The only one in the US in Loma Linda. This is a community of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda. Yeah, I see some thumbs up over here from Donna um, and a few other folks as well. So Loma Linda is a uh, community where about half the population in this city is vegetarian or vegan because it's a part of the faith. And there's been a study going on for the last 40 years called the Adventist Health Study where they've been going really in depth. And it's a fascinating place to study because this is a community where pretty much everybody has the same faith. They generally have a similar socioeconomic status. Uh, there's, uh, they all live in the same environment, same air, same water system, right? So there's a lot of common factors that people have in common. And then you've got this population division where about a quarter of the people are vegan, about a quarter of the people are vegetarian, about half the people aren't, but they all get a lot of exercise and they all have strong social ties and they all have a strong sense of faith and values that connect them together. And uh, so what do we see in the Adventist, Adventist health study? We, we see that the population that, that lives the longest are the vegans and the pescatarians within that population. They outlive the omnivores in that same community by about nine or 10 years on average. And there's enough of them that they have upleveled the, the uh, life expectancy for all of Loma Linda to the point that it is the only blue zone in the United States. They have the longest lived and healthiest population in the United States, not because they're super rich, not because they have crazy expensive medical insurance, but because they live a healthy diet and lifestyle. And particularly the vegetarians, vegans, and pescatarians. So uh, I find that quite fascinating and uh, quite heartening, so to speak that uh, we can learn from places where people really are practicing this, not just for a day or a week or a month, but they've been doing it their whole life and multiple generations in many cases, and we see the results. And here's the thing, a lot of folks I know, especially as they get older, they're like, oh, I don't wanna live to hundred. You know, like we've seen people who live a long time and quite frankly, the last few years, the quality of life isn't so great. You know, my grandma, you know, lived into her nineties, but she had Alzheimer's, she was blind, she couldn't remember her own family members. You know, the last times I saw her, she didn't remember my name, you know? And you have to wonder like, what's that quality of life like, right? And I don't know anybody who really wants to live old like that. But the question is not just life quantity, but life quality. Not just adding years to your life, but also adding life to your years so that they're rich and full and vibrant and beautiful and you can do the things you love and contribute to the lives of others and, and be a part of the solution in the world. And, you know, that's what I want. And I think that's probably what all of us want. And so a whole foods plant centered diet is often touted for helping to lead to longer lives. But I think more important is that it leads to better leads to better lives because you're less likely to be addicted to dependent upon drugs and surgeries and medical care and assisted living and all the other things that typically go with aging in our society. You're more likely to be independent and resilient. And the, the, in the blue zones, people still die. They die later, but they also die much faster, interestingly. So they tend to live really long, vibrant, healthy lives right up to the end. And then the very end, it's like crash and they're done. And I don't know about y'all, but that's that's kind of how I'd want to go. I don't want to have a really, really, really painfully long runway on that. You know, I really want to enjoy my life to the end. And so that's, that's what I think we can look forward to supporting when we put these kind of choices into action. Now, y'all probably read about it in the book, but um, just to talk a little bit more about my grandpa, since I know everyone wants to talk about that. Uh, my grandpa, Irv, uh, um, he started Baskin Robbins with his brother-in-law, Bert Baskin. And uh, my dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer at all times. Actually, there were a lot more than 31. Um, they were always testing out new flavors and 
he was his job as a kid. What kind of job is this for a kid, right? He got paid to help invent ice cream flavors. <laughs> and his claim to fame was Jamocha Almond Fudge. He invented Jamocha Almond Fudge. So you can credit my dad for a few heart attacks and a lot of smiles. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, that one um, was one of their inventions. And um, so it was, I mean, that was a fun, that was a fun thing for a kid, of course. But he also, um, he also didn't uh, want to contribute to, you know, more people getting sick. And as he got a little older, he realized that ice cream is no health food. And his uncle, Bert Baskin, was dying of heart disease. My dad's uncle, Bert, ended up passing away at the age of 54. He was one of the most successful entrepreneurs in American history, but he didn't have his health and he lost his life. And so as my dad was growing up, he was seeing that and he was seeing his own dad suffering from the standard American diseases that come with the standard American diet. And he said, you know what? I don't want to spend my life selling a product that might contribute to more people like my uncle dying too soon, you know? So, so he ended up walking away from a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream to follow his own rocky road, as we say in our family. And um, he moved with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada. They built this one room log cabin. They grew most of their own food. They practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day, and they named their kid Ocean. And uh, they almost named me Kale, by the way. And this was way before Kale was cool. Um, but we did eat a lot of kale and cabbage and carrots and other veggies from the garden. And as I got a little older, we ended up moving to California. And that's when my dad began working on his book, Diet for a New America, his first book, which came out 35 years ago. And it inspired millions of people to look at food as a chance to make a difference in the world. And the media called him the rebel without a cone and the prophet of nonprofit and other such terms. Um, it, amazingly, out of his millions of readers, one of the people whose lives he changed was Grandpa Irv. My grandpa was practically on death's door. He was um, suffering from serious diabetes, heart issues, and weight issues. Uh, his doctors told him he didn't have long to live unless he made some big changes, and they give him a copy of Diet for New America, which amazingly my grandpa read. Now, he read the copy the doctor gave him. He didn't read the signed copy my dad had sent him when the book came out. He read the copy the doctor gave him because uh, I guess he figured it had been blessed by the high priest of Western medicine. Um, so he read it though, and he got results because he, he put it into action. He wanted to live. He ended up cutting way down on his sugar consumption, way down on his animal product consumption, eating way more vegetables and whole foods. He gave up sugar actually, and he even gave up ice cream. And he got results. He lost 30 pounds. His golf game improved seven strokes. He reversed his diabetes and his heart disease. He got off all the medications he'd been told he would need to take for the rest of his life. He started going for big walks every morning with his dog, and they would walk for several miles every single day. He lived 19 more healthy years, not just 19 more years, 19 more healthy, good years. And um, so we really have seen in our family what happens when we follow the status quo is my dad's uncle Bert is a good example and dad of heart disease at 54. My grandpa's another good example, you know, at, in his late sixties on death's doorstep. But we've also seen what can happen when we make a change as my grandpa is a testament. And quite frankly, as the years have gone by and as I've been working with my dad in Food Evolution Network, um, we, we heard so many stories of diseases reversed and lives reclaimed and health reclaimed and hope reclaimed and dreams were born and families that didn't have to lose loved ones too soon. And every one of them warms my heart and gives me hope and gives me courage and determination to keep going and keep spreading the word and keep seeing how we can share this more widely with more people. And, um, you know, I think another piece that's really important, which you all got from 31 Day Food Revolution, is that food's very social. You know, it's something that connects us throughout history. Breaking bread together, sharing a meal together has been a source of connection between people. And uh, that can cut against us because in a toxic food culture, it's very hard to go against 
the, the norms around us. You know, family members will take it personally if you don't make the cookies they baked for you or, you know, eat the steak they made for you or whatever it might be. They'll feel like you don't love them, like you don't care about them, like you're turning your back on all your family traditions. Well, this is what you grew up with. Why? You think you're too good for us, you know? And people can feel hurt. They can feel, and you can feel estranged, right? When you just try to do the right thing for your health. And so um, I'm really interested in how we can flip that script because the other side of it is that you can also be a part of the solution. You can also be an inspiration to other people. When you choose a healthier path, you help make it easier for others in your family, others in your community to do the same. You build a new culture really that's built around healthier eating. And you know, I love traditions and I love culture and I love feeling connected to our ancestors at the same time. Uh, we all know that human beings are evolving and the world is changing. And so we can't just go back in history. We have to go forward and do the best we can to hopefully take the best of our ancestors, but also hopefully offer something even better to our children, you know? And when it comes to food choices, you know, learning how to reshape our food patterns in ways that take the best of our histories, but also let behind those parts that may have been born out of distress or pain or suffering or trauma or violence that a lot of people have endured in their ancestral histories can be such a way to reclaim our health and our lives as we move forward to create a brighter future and a more liberated future for ourselves and our, our future generations. So I think that's really uh, powerful and, um, I think that every time we choose real food and healthy food and wholesome food, every time we choose love and stress reduction and exercise, we are actually contributing to a healthier culture where it's easier for everybody around us to make those same kinds of choices and to be a part of the solution and, and to be vibrant and alive and choose wellness over the status quo of suffering and sickness and premature death. I think that's an incredible opportunity and I know it's challenging, but it's also so, so, so worth it. And, um, you know, part one of food revolution, a 31 day food revolution is about how you can detoxify. Part two is about how you can nourish, how you can really say yes to the good foods that are proven in so many studies to be healthy for your body and wellness. Part three is gather. It's about that social side. It's about sharing food and sharing connection and building strong ties around healthy choices. And then part four is transform. And honestly, that's the most exciting part for me because I am so passionate about helping to change the world, you know, for the better. Uh, I don't think it's right that statistically, um, the poorer you are, the harder it is to access healthy food in the United States. And so what we've done is we've created a subsidy system where junk food is subsidized. We subsidize so-called commodities crops with taxpayer money that bring down the price in effect of high fructose corn syrup, of white bread, and a factory farmed meat. And that creates a competitive disadvantage where fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds cost more at the marketplace in comparison. So what does that do? Well, if people have got lots of money, not much, they can still afford whatever they want. But for folks who don't, it condemns them to nutritional disasters. And so then we wonder, why is it that obesity rates are highest in lower income communities? We wonder, why is it that the poorer you are, the younger you die, and the more you live sick? And it's like, it's a handicap for anybody who wants to break free and have economic opportunity or prosperity in their family when they've been struggling. Well, it's gonna be that much harder if you're sick, if you've got extra pounds, if you've got brain fog, if you're suffering and struggling just to get by, if you're hurting day in and day out. Well, guess what? It's not an accident. These are vicious feedback loops that keep people trapped in suffering and pain. And one of the ways we can change that is by shifting some of the policies that systematically keep people sick. If we're gonna subsidize anything, let's subsidize healthy food. Why don't we double the value of SNAP dollars for fruits and vegetables? It's been piloted in a bunch of communities. Wholesome Wave is running this program right now. 500,000 people who are on the SNAP program have access to it. And guess what? When we do that, they buy more fruits and vegetables, they eat more fruits and vegetables, and they're healthier because of it. Why can't doctors prescribe fruits and vegetables to patients and get it covered by insurance? 
just like they prescribe drugs, drugs and surgery and get it covered by insurance. Because guess what? It'll probably save money and it'll get better results for the patient than most of the drugs and surgeries out there. We have some testing of this. It's been piloted also by Wholesome Wave. At Tufts University did a study and they found that when this was done, when produce prescriptions were a thing, uh, that it actually was a cost-effective intervention against heart disease and diabetes. So I think this is one of those things. Yeah, but the doctors won't. Here's uh, Kim is saying, oh, I'm seeing some of the comments here. Apologies, I haven't been commenting back, but Kim said, but the doctors won't make money. Yes, so true, right? So this is the thing when you create a health system and a food system where profits are more important than human life and the future of life on our planet, this is what you get. You get people who are strung out on drugs instead of eating healthy food. You get com whole communities that can't access healthy food and they're left depending on 7-Eleven and local convenience stores to feed their families. You know, you, you get people who are nutritionally depleted, even if they're overweight and they don't know why they don't feel good. Well, guess what? It's addictive cycles that even set in. When you're feeling bad, you're more likely to make bad choices because that's how the cycle works, right? When you're feeling energetic and joyous, you're more likely to reach for the kale. When you're feeling bad, you're more likely to reach for the Doritos. Well, when these vicious cycles are in place and you've got poverty and you've got stress and you've got racism in a lot of cases, and you've got all the violences that go on in our society, it becomes so hard to break out of that cycle. But here's the thing, when you do break out of that cycle, you have more energy, you have more vitality, you have more clarity, you have more ability to make good choices, and you have more ability to shift the, the health and wellness of a whole community. And when you do that, you help to shift the culture in a positive direction. So to me, the food revolution, the way we transform this world is number one, one bite at a time, one step at a time. We all get to be a part of the solution and literally shift the course of history. And number two, we can organize. We can contribute to school gardens. We can contribute to healthier school lunches. We can contribute to healthier meals and cafeteria. We can contribute to government policies that support health and wellness in communities, doubling of SNAP dollars for fruits and vegetables, produce prescriptions. These are things that could radically change the health of the communities that are struggling the most right now. For the 55 million Americans right now who are dependent on SNAP dollars every day to feed their families, what would happen if they had double value for fruits and vegetables? For all of the millions and millions of people being diagnosed with heart disease every year in this country, what would happen if their doctor gave them a, a little slip that gave them the ability to get free fruits and vegetables for their families? We could turn the tide we could save millions of lives and we could help lift people out of generational cycles of poverty because with clearer minds, with more energy, with less medical bills, with less suffering, less time in hospitals, more time in the workforce, more time to do things they love, more time to take care of the grandkids, more time to play and celebrate, their families and their communities are uplifted and the world becomes a brighter and safer place for future generations. Not only that, we're helping save tropical rainforests, we're helping sequester carbon out of the atmosphere, we're helping to save water. I mean, yes, oh, the things we can achieve, says Alicia, so true, Alicia and Eugene, so true. And yeah, good evening, our new, new mayor, Eric Adams, yes, instated Vegan Friday in the school system. Today, how wonderful, Jeanette, yes, wonderful. We interviewed Eric for our last Food Revolution Summit. Um, just a few months ago, it was wonderful. He wasn't mayor yet at that time. Um, but yeah, as you all know, he had his life completely transformed by a whole foods plant-based diet. He considers that it saved his life and he's super passionate about this. Um, so um, yeah, I'm excited to see what's gonna happen in New York now as he's, he's trying to do all that he can because he gets it. You know, whatever you think of his politics on whatever this or that, like this is something he gets and I think it's pretty awesome. So yes, wonderful. Well, let me let me open to let's see. I'll just see some of the comments here. Uh, Kim said I had a love affair with Jamoka Almond Fudge. Well, good choice. <laughs> um, and, well, Chef, uh, we actually have some questions for you um, oh, great. to start with. So I think um, one of the reasons many people are on this call is because they want you to tell them what to eat. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> And one of the things that has been really difficult as we go on this plant-based journey um, is the oil piece and the mm -hmm. taking out 
of the processed oil. So can you please explain what is the problem with the oil? Absolutely. Well, so oil is a processed food. Anytime you take a whole food and you break it down and you process it into something that you could only really get in a laboratory or a factory, you lose something, right? So if you take flour, if you take a whole grain and you mill it, that's one form of processing. Then if you separate out the wheat and the germ, I mean, excuse me, the bran and the germ, and you just create the endosperm and you get the white flour and you've taken away all the fiber and most of the vitamins and minerals that were in the bran and the germ, which are outside and inside of the wheat. And you just get the white part that's in the middle. So that's what white flour is. Uh, white sugar, you're taking sugar cane and you're grinding it up and you're making juice out of it and then you're drying the juice, but then you do all this process to separate it to get the molasses and the white sugar separated. And then you've got, again, a refined product. So the molasses is where most of the iron and vitamins and minerals are. And the sugar is just nothing but pure sugar, right? And you've already, when you juice it, you've taken out all the fiber. So the thing is, when you eat whole foods of any kind, even sugar cane, you're getting a whole bunch of vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you lose when you process it and separate those things out. Um, and so um, this is very true of oils. So if you take, for example, a whole coconut, you've got some fiber in there, you've got some sweetness in there, you've got some carbohydrates in there. And what we find is that fiber is one of the most critical pieces to, to our food because we all need fiber. Less than 5% of the American public gets the recommended amount of fiber. Most of us probably need even more than the recommended amount. And fiber is essential, not just to keeping you regular, which it does, but fiber is also what feeds your microbiome. So the, the bacteria in your gut depend on fiber for their food. That's what they eat. Uh, particularly, you know, there's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. They each have their own benefits. Soluble fiber is particularly good for being the good guys in your digestive tract. And so you want to get that fiber in there, but if you're eating processed foods, you're missing out. So oil has no fiber um, and it has very little of the minerals and uh, loses a lot of the vitamins of the original whole food. Okay. So for example, soybean oil, soybeans have a lot of protein. They've got a lot of fiber. They've got a lot of phytoestrogens, which actually help fight cancer. But when soybean oil doesn't have any of that, it's just the oil from it, and it's very high in omega-6 fatty acids. Now, here's the thing about fatty acids. There's a lot of different types of uh, fats, right? But the, the big ones to be aware of are omega-3 and omega-6. So omega-6 is super high in soy oil. It's high in um, sunflower oil. It's, it's high in cottonseed oil. Um, most of the bottled oils that we're consuming today. Um, and omega-3s, so omega-6 is pro-inflammatory and a certain amount of inflammation is necessary in your life, but omega-3s essentially are anti-inflammatory. And most of us have what? Too much inflammation, right? In the modern world. And so part of that is because we get about 16 parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. And the ideal is more like two to one. And so where do you get your omega-3s? Well, if you're talking oils, they're high in flax and chia seeds in particular. So flax oil is one source, and then they're also high in fish. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people in studies do better eating fish is because they're getting the omega-3s from fish, right? Um, but you can also get them from plants and without all the toxins and heavy metals that come from commercial fishing. Um, omega-9s are the main oil in avocado oil and in olive oil. And so uh, they are neither three or six. So you're kind of getting something different and they have some benefit to human bodies, though uh, it's still a refined food. So I would say if you're gonna eat oils, then the healthiest one is gonna be flax oil, but that's expensive and it doesn't taste good and you can't cook with it. So you can use it in like some salad dressings or things uh, and we do, but not as the only oil necessarily, unless you're just going for nutrition. Um, but from a culinary perspective, you know, it could be maybe a quarter of your oil or a third of it at most, and then it starts to be a little strong. Um, and then you can use a little canola oil if you want to. It's a very mild flavored oil. It's about three parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. So it's not as bad as some of the others like sunflower or corn oil or soy oil that are much, much higher in omega-6s. And then olive oil and avocado oil, again, 
are probably your best oils for like stir frying and sauteing and things like that. Um, and like we use for salad dressing, I will use some olive oil along with some flax oil. Um, and then, um, you know, put that together with a bit of canola. So I've ended up with a one to one omega six to three ratio because canola is three parts, six to one part three. Flax is six parts, is three parts three to one part six. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they balance each other out canola and flax, and then olive oil has neither six or three. So grapeseed oil is pretty high in omega-6s, I'm sorry to say. So some people think it's a health food, but not on those grounds. Um, and um, so yeah, oils are tricky. The, the best uh, thing is to stay away from them if you can, as much as possible. And they, the Esselstyn program has no oil in it. The Ornish program has very, very little oil, a little bit of olive or avocado oil, and that's it. Um, the Nutritarian Diet, Dr. Furman's program has almost no oil. If you're trying to reverse heart disease, go as low oil as you can. But if you are gonna eat oil, make sure that it's high in omega-3s or that it's olive or avocado. Um, and uh, it used to be thought that you wanted to avoid nuts and seeds. The Ornish program was very low fat originally. Dr. Ornish has evolved on that some as new research has been done. He now includes some nuts and seeds and it's every bit as good for heart health and it's better for certain other nutritional markers to get some nuts and seeds in there, particularly flax and chia seeds. Those are like the superstars. If you can grind some up, we have a dedicated coffee grinder. We grind up flax and chia meal and then put that in the fridge and every week I kind of replenish it. And uh, so it's fairly fresh that way. And then put you know a few tablespoons on oatmeal or in a smoothie or in a casserole or even sprinkle on a salad and uh, it's so good for you. You're getting protein and loads of fiber and lignans and also omega-3 fatty acids, um, which are really healthy. Um, uh, and coconut so oil, there was a question about coconut oil. And let me say, I'm not a fan. Um, there are probably some people for whom it's healthy and beneficial, but um, for most people, well, coconut oil is very high in saturated fat. It's actually more highly saturated than any animal products out there. and in general, saturated fat is, is found in animal products and in tropical oils, coconut oil, chocolate, palm kernel oil. Chocolate's got a lot of other great benefits, but it does have some saturated fat. But, but the big sources are palm oil and coconut oil that people are getting other than animal products. And saturated fats are associated with higher rates of heart disease. There's just no way around it. Um, and um, I know people who've gone vegan and they're eating whole foods, plant-based, and their LDL cholesterol is still stubbornly high. And then they cut out the coconut oil and boom, it drops way down like they expected. So sometimes coconut oil is that missing piece for a lot of people. Give that up, give up the palm oil and it can make a really big difference. I think one of the areas of confusion and also where people may feel overwhelmed is the conflicting information. So we've read Eat to Live um, we've read Eric Adams' book, we've read your book, and so, um, and we follow Caldwell Esselstyn, we've watched Forks Over Knives, we actually yeah. attended a talk um, that Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn did this past Wednesday, and he pretty much said, do not put oil anywhere yep. near your body ever, yep. and so um, I think there's confusion. Um, something happened today um, that some of you may have seen, and many of you not yet, maybe until you watch the evening news, but um, in the news today, it says that Eric Adams um, stated that he does eat fish now and some, and also eats some meat and chicken. And so I know for many people who are using him and not to focus on him per se, but the example that that gives of, okay, so you said you're doing one thing and yeah. now you're doing this other thing. Is this not sustainable? Is mm -hmm. it not practical? Even in your book, you state that you eat a little bit of, um, meat and fish that are of a better quality um, from time to time as well. So I think there's confusion about, and yeah. the drawing line seems to be, if you are really sick, stay away from all of it. But um, Dr. Esselstyn said, if you don't wanna become really sick, stay away from all of it as well. So yeah, yeah so what should we eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, I don't wanna make the perfect into the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. You know, we do the best we can with life and none of us, you don't have to sign a purity pact to, to take care of your health and move in healthy directions, right? Um, 
and every bite counts and every step counts. And I don't want to scare people away with trying to be a purist, right? Um, if you are dealing with a serious medical condition and your life's on the line, you should act like it. And in that situation, that's a time to say, okay, my recommendation dietarily, nothing but whole plant foods. I, I think fish is arguable. Candidly, studies seem to indicate that people who eat fish tend to do better than people who don't. That's just the data. But is that because they're eating fish instead of beef, for example? Or is that because they were eating an optimally planned whole foods vegan diet? Like we don't have that data. We don't have that research. I think that people who eat an optimally planned whole foods vegan diet, in other words, like a nutritarian type of approach with some supplemental EPA and DHA, which is two of the omega-3 fatty acids that you can only get from algae or from fish, then uh, you know that seems to be fabulous for health, right? And that's why we see in the Adventist health study that the vegans and the pescatarians are about equal in terms of life expectancy. So, you know, everyone has to sense their own moral values, their own uh, ethical values, their own sensibilities around their own health and make their own decisions about what's right for them. There isn't one perfect answer for everybody. We're all unique. Every body is unique. And depending on your health history, your life stage, your values and ethics, your weight and your lifestyle and your family systems, and your genetics, different foods will be different for you or may even impact you differently at different times in your life. Some people can drink a cup of coffee in the morning and they feel like themselves. And if they don't, they feel awful. And there are studies showing that coffee, for example, is associated with longevity, with less rates of Alzheimer's, less rates of heart disease, all kinds of great things. But at the same time, there are people who have a cup of coffee any time of day and they can't sleep that night and their nervous system is all haywire and their adrenals are all out of whack. So you gotta listen to your own body and see, right? Just cause it's good for some people, even a lot of people doesn't mean it's good for everybody. What I will say on the fish piece is that um, I think that low mercury, high omega-3 fish can, you know, which specifically is like sardines or wild salmon may have some health benefits, but there's still ethical concerns, right? There's still concerns about overfishing of the oceans and there's still some toxins. And quite frankly, the whole world can't eat a lot of wild salmon or else there will be no wild salmon left, right? So these are challenges we've got to navigate and make our own best decisions on based on our own sensibilities and values. Um, and you can also go, you know, again, for the algae sourced EPA and DHA, get some of that every day. Uh, just in little capsules or whatever. And um, that can make a huge difference. Some friends of mine put out a product called Complement, and it's made for vegans who want to get those critical nutrients met. And so they combine EPA, DHA, vitamin D3, vitamin B12, zinc, magnesium, selenium, vitamin K2. And uh, you get it all in one, take three capsules a day and boom, you've got all of those needs met at once. So if you go to foodrevolution.org slash complement, you can actually order it online there. Again, foodrevolution.org slash complement. I think that's a great sort of one-stop shop for, for meeting a lot of those problems. Not that everybody needs zinc or selenium or whatever, but, but some people do. And it's nice to just get a baseline amount so you know you're kind of covered and then you don't have to worry about those things so much. I'm not a big fan of supplements in general, but I do think that there are a few that can be beneficial for some people. And it's nice when they make it simple like that. Um, as far as, uh, oils, again, I hear, I know Dr. Esselstyn's approach. It's awesome. It works for a lot of people. I personally think that, uh, for, for prevention, it's not necessary, uh, to eat no oil. And there are studies showing as with fish that avocado oil and olive oil are linked to longer life expectancy for some people. So I do think that, uh, but again, is that because they're using it instead of soy oil and you know other oils, lard or whatever, or is it because they're actually better off with it than without it on a you know healthy, well planned vegan diet? We don't entirely know. Um, nuts and seeds again linked to longer life expectancy for a lot of people. I know Dr. Esselstyn is not a big fan. Dr. Ornish includes you know a few tablespoons a day of nuts or seeds, recommends that, um, but not a lot. 
Uh, and then there are other folks like um, doc Dr. Furman is a fan of nuts and seeds. He thinks we need lots of good healthy fats. They should just come from whole foods. So he's also a fan of avocado, for example. Um, eating avocados is better than avocado oil. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, so as much as possible, getting your fats from whole foods is a great way to go. Um, what about good fats for people who have epileptic seizures, asked Donna. Well, epileptic seizures can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, but uh, yeah, it is probably uh, certainly worth trying, you know, getting some good healthy fats in there. There have been some studies showing that for certain types of epilepsy, a ketogenic diet can be beneficial, which of course is a very high fat diet that's very low in carbohydrates. It's the only thing that seems to be helped truly by a ketogenic diet. Keto diet can lead to short-term weight loss, sometimes dramatically so, but it doesn't tend to stick and it creates a whole bunch of other health problems down the road. So whole foods, plant-based diet can get the same weight loss, but it's good for you, good for you. and it's good for the planet. And um, so uh, I'm not a fan of keto, but if you have somebody in your family who's dealing with epilepsy, talk to your doctor, discuss the type, et cetera, it may be that a ketogenic diet is worth a try in that situation because there are some studies of benefit there specifically. There was a question about sugar and whether the craving for sugar is something that has to do with a chemical imbalance or is there something else going on? But one thing I will say is that many of us did the full 31 um, days reading your book. But in addition to that, we followed the nutritarian um, diet. And so all mm -hmm. of those sugar cravings and everything else are actually gone. Even the desire um, for oils and all of that, we did it the strict nutritarian way. So I would ask like, what would that speak to in terms of the addictive quality and perhaps the habit of eating those things often? And when you finally stop kind of giving your body a rest from it, then the desire for it may go away. So is it a chemical imbalance or is there something else going on with sugar? So um, of course there are sweet, there's sugars in all sorts of foods, you know, pretty much all plant foods have sugars in them. But really what we're talking about here is, ref is um, refined sugars or processed sugars, right? Like added sugars, like um, sugar cane or, you know, sweeteners that we put in things. and um, yeah, it's, it's very a habit forming. I mean, sugar triggers chemical reactions in the brain that are not unlike drugs. You know, in fact, uh, it's, uh, yeah, agave is, I'm sorry to tell you from a nutritional standpoint, agave is worse than probably even than sugar, like straight up sugar. Um, the types of sugars that it contains are probably even worse, um, certainly worse than honey. Um, honey has some benefits um, if you don't mind the bee situation um, or you can get it from a source where they treat the bees well. Um, the, um, but it's not a great food. Uh, the, the best sugars, yeah, date sugar is gonna be um, a good option because it's literally ground up dates and there you it's a whole food actually. It's just been ground up. Um, coconut sugar is uh, somewhat refined. It's probably one of the better uh, added sweeteners out there. Um, but the best ones, date sugar is going to be the best. We're actually using dates, like in blending them up or whatever. Uh, and then I like to use xylitol sometimes in certain instances. I use xylitol mints actually for dental health because xylitol is alkalizing in the mouth and it doesn't raise your blood sugar. And uh, stevia can also be nice in some situations, but in general, you really want to focus, coconut nectar and coconut sugar are kind of the same thing. Um, in general, you really want to focus on using, getting sweets from whole foods. So that's going to be dates and it's going to be fruits, especially, um, you know, we make an amazing frozen dessert in our family. Of course, you would expect that from our family, right? So we will put in the blender, we blend up some frozen bananas um, and a little bit of soy milk. And then we'll add, sometimes we add some vanilla and uh, vanilla extract and some nutmeg, uh, or else we'll go in a more fruity direction and add some um, strawberries and mango. Um, or you can, you know, you can go with blueberries, different kinds of fruits, frozen, all frozen. Blend that up using the soy milk to kind of cream it up. And then you end up with this amazing soft serve ice cream that you can put in cones 
And I mean, our kids love it. It's like our favorite family dessert and it only takes like five minutes to make. All you've got to do is have the stuff in the freezer ready to go. Yeah, it's kind of a nice cream you could say. Um, and yeah, frozen bananas are just the best. And then you can add all these other things and bananas are quite sweet. And you can make baked goods using, you know, dates, date sugar, even bananas um, and uh, that can turn out quite well. We have a lot of recipes on foodrevolution.org if you want to search around for different recipes for including sweets and things like that. There's some great things you can make um, using whole plant foods um, and even using nuts and seeds and it can really be good for you. They're not, honestly, they're not going to taste as good as Farrell's donuts, you know, or Baskin Robbins ice cream at first for somebody who's used to eating that way. But your taste buds can change over time. And that's the really wonderful news. Some of you have already experienced this. And uh, there's actually studies showing that when people eat kale for the first time, it tastes bitter. But around the fifth or 10th time, their saliva is starting to secrete enzymes that actually make it taste sweeter. They're learning how to break it down in their mouth and the actual experience changes. And uh, I've had the experience, even as a healthy eater as I am, if I eat some kind of dessert, about three or four nights in a row, then around night five, I'm like looking forward to dessert. I'm thinking about it a little bit too much. I'm like expecting it. My body is like organizing around it. Um, but the good news is for me, because you know I don't have a lot of food addiction tendencies in, in my life, and obviously I have a background of healthy eating, it's easy for me to shift that. And I just take a couple nights off and I don't even miss it. I don't even want desserts. Like, genuinely late at night, I'm working late, I wanna keep going. I could be craving like, you know, some munchy crunchy carrots or apples, you know? I'm like, I'm not like reaching for the Doritos because we don't have them in the house, but also because that's just not how my system is wired. So the good news is it's possible. You really can repattern your brain and repattern your body so that you crave what's good for you. And eventually you can actually fall in love with foods that love you back. And I like what you just said. Um about the chips and that's one of my favorite parts of the book when your wife tells you to just stop buying um the chips so that then your son won't keep asking for them and in that case they're not <laughs> in the house and it seems so simplistic but that's what we say in heart smarts as well do not bring it in the house because you're yeah. going to eat it if it's in the house 2 a.m you will be up looking for it <laughs> um to eat it so just don't buy it um just to shift a little bit there's an entire section in the book about pots and um the better pots to use and to cook with can you mm -hmm. explain that a little bit more yeah absolutely so ideally you want to be cooking in stainless steel or potentially ceramic or something if you if that's your thing but um you, you want to especially avoid the non-stick pans like with Teflon and other um, chemical compounds like that. And the reason is that these pans have been treated with chemicals that can off gas. And if you ever cook at more than medium heat, that can really trigger that. Some of them even used to come with warnings, some may still saying that not to use them uh, on high heat if you have a bird in the house. Ever heard of the canary in the coal mine? Coal miners would take canaries with them. And if the canaries die, they know that it's toxic and they get out because the canaries die before the people do. Well, similarly, birds are more sensitive to gases, uh, toxic gases and fumes. And so, um, yeah, there've been a lot of bird deaths in this country from birds you know, in cages that were killed when they were in the home, when people were using nonstick pans. So if it's bad for birds, it doesn't take a coal miner to know it's probably bad for us too. And, um, you know, there are, there are studies that link some of the compounds that are found in these nonstick pans with higher rates of cancer and um, other ailments. So um, best recommendation is to steer clear. If you're looking for a pan that you can saute stuff in, for example, um, my favorite option is to go with enamel coated cast iron. Uh, cast iron itself is very, very heavy and takes a lot of treatment, and that can be an option for some people, but for other people, it's not their favorite. Um, but enamel coated cast iron is much thinner, and it's got this coating on it that's more robust and permanent. It's not as wonderfully non stick as Teflon, but it can also last for years and years and years, and it won't wear out. 
Um, you still want to not heat it on a super high heat and you want to not use metal spoons on it because they can um, degrade it faster, but it'll last a lot longer. So yeah, enamel coated cast iron is what I was saying. Um, there are other pans coming out all the time. Staub, S-T-A-U-B, makes some pans. They're expensive, but if you're going to have it for 10 or 20 years, then, you know, it's quite worth getting a good pan um, and uh, it'll help support your health. What you don't want to do is use uh, I, um, a pan that is so sticky that you end up saturating everything in oil <laughs> to try to cook with it, right? And otherwise it sticks on the bottom and burns because burnt food isn't good for you and oily food isn't good for you. So these are the trade-offs you have to make. But if you can get a pan that's reasonably non-stick and that also um, you know, doesn't off-gas, that's sort of the sweet spot. Um, yeah. Yep, there's a question about water, um, several questions. So what kind of water should we be drinking? Is it necessary to be wor worried about the pH of the water or the alkaline level of the water? And then also, yeah. should we completely stop um, buying bottled water in plastic? Yeah, so um, I'm not a big fan of absolutes, but if possible, yes, we should stop buying bottled water in plastic. Here's, here's the thing. The plastic's bad for the planet, and it's also potentially bad for us. The plastics they're using, those type one plastics that are used for most bottled waters, are um, generally inert, but put them in the sunshine and they will off gas. And then you're drinking the toxins that are in the plastic, which you do not want in your body, believe me. So um, you want to just get away from that. And we have so much plastic in our world and we're dumping it in the oceans and we're turning, it, it's, it's made from fossil fuels and it's just not what we want to be drinking our water from. So uh, my big recommendation is to get a home purifier um, of some kind that you can use at home, hook up to your tap water and then uh, refill. I mean, here's my, you know, just stainless steel water jug and I just fill it up and drink away, you know, and it's great to carry that with you, plan ahead, have the convenience of having a few good water jugs and fill them up and take them with you on the road. You don't need an alkaline water system. Um, al the thing with alkaline water is that you could get the same effect by putting a little sprinkling of baking soda in your water. That would alkalize it too. Um, but your stomach pH is like two point something. There's no evidence that shows that drinking alkaline water will have any effect on the alkalinity of your body. And it actually shouldn't have any effect on the alkalinity of your blood because your blood is supposed to have a stable pH and your body will do what it needs to do to make that happen. If it didn't have that, you would die. Um, so, um, th th there's, you know, there are certain body parts that may do better a little bit on the alkaline side. I'm not talking about the blood, but that has more to do with how your body responds to nourishment. The best thing is eating lots of vegetables. Quite frankly, it seems that, um, the animal products tend to be acidifying. Um, but there's little to no evidence that alkaline water has any benefit. Um, I personally, because somebody gave it to me, because people are always giving me things they're hoping I will promote. Um, somebody gave me an alkaline water system. I, I'm sorry, excuse me, let me take that back. They gave me a hydrogen water system. Um, so it adds a little bit of hydrogen molecules to the water. I like the taste. I continue to use it. I don't know that I would buy it. It's expensive. Um, but you know, it, it may be that hydrogen water does have some benefits. There's some studies that are pretty interesting, way more so than alkaline. So if you're dealing with like cancer in your family or some other really serious health outcome, uh, you may want to try hydrogen water. It won't hurt and it might help, but this isn't, this is a qualified non-endorsement. It's just to like, maybe check it out, right? If you go to foodrevolution.org and look for water, you can find an article we wrote on some of the different options. And you know, certainly hydrogen could be an option. Um, and then you can also go for just something that will get the chlorine out. And that's really the big thing. So carbon filters can do the job well. Reverse osmosis do the job even better and they're even more clear cleansing than, hydro than, than um, carbon. Uh, the thing with carbon is you've got to maintain it. You've got to change the filters every so often because they'll get saturated with toxins. So you've got to remember to do the maintenance that's recommended. And it is kind of a case of a bit of you get what you pay for. If you get a like $10 water filter, it's probably not going to be great. 
So you want to be spending, I'd say at least a hundred dollars, you know, to get a water filter. Multipure makes some good ones. If you're wanting to get one that's, you know, a better, higher quality carbon filter. And then um, AquaTrue makes some, um, some reverse osmosis systems that are the most economical and they're very high quality. So we, we have a link. I think if you go to foodrevolution.org slash water, you can find out more about them. Um, what about the Brita filter? There's a question in the chat about Brita. Is that a good one? Uh, they're okay. They're okay. I'm not, I'm not a huge, huge fan. They're, they're affordable. They've really done a good job making a decent water filter affordable. Okay. Um, and, I think, I think you'll get better quality with like an AquaTrue. Um, but it's all, you know, you have to look at your own budget and what you can work with. The big thing is get your own water filter of some kind and use that over the bottled water and the plastics. And that'll save money too, by the way. Okay, great. And then looking at on the topic of supplements, what are your views in general? And then this month um, for February, we are focused on the gut microbiome and heart health. And so do you like um, the idea of people taking prebiotics and probiotics? And if so, um, how should they take them? Or are there any that you suggest are better than others? So um, prebiotics are what sort of feed the good bacteria in your gut. And then probiotics are actually eating bacteria that you're hoping will migrate down there and reproduce. And if you had to choose one or the other, I'd say eating the prebiotics is even more important because you probably already have good bacteria in your gut and you've got to feed them, right? So they don't starve to death and they'll reproduce really, really fast. And then you'll have more of them. There's no point in taking a bunch of you know, fancy supplements that just go in one end and then they get down there and then they die because they don't have anything to eat, right? So getting the soluble fiber going is critical. And, you know, eating lots of whole foods is really the best way to go. There are certain foods that are really high in certain types of fiber that are particularly beneficial. Um, Jerusalem artichokes are fantastic. Onions, garlic, really good. Interestingly, wheat, uh, as, as many people are, are down on gluten, but wheat, bran, and germ have some very beneficial prebiotic components in them. So if you do eat whole grain wheat, that's one reason for it. It's not everyone does well with that. Um, and, um, you know, their acacia fiber is the probably one of the very best. If you're going to like take a supplement and you want to take a, a tablespoon of that a day in a smoothie or something, that's pretty awesome. Um, Can you spell that? A-C-A-C-I-A. -A -C -A. Okay. I'll just type it in the chat. Acacia fiber. There's lots of you know supplements and things like that that just sell acacia fiber. So you can get that. What's wrong with cast iron? If you don't have a high iron problem, I'll just answer that quickly and then I'll circle back. Um, so um, if, you, if you don't have too much iron uh, or if you have too little iron, cast iron can be fine. Uh, it just, it's heavy and you have to maintain the pan well. It takes seasoning and attention and care. Some people really like that and they're really into their cast irons and they're very proud of them. But you know, you don't wanna use soap, for example, with a cast iron pan. And if you don't treat it right, then it can lose its nonstick features and start to erode iron into your food. Um, and for a lot of people, they have too much iron in their bodies. And then in that situation, uh, cast iron can actually be quite negative because you're getting more than, more than is good for you. Um, people worry about anemia a lot and it is a concern, but actually more people have too much iron than too little. And um, that's linked to a lot of uh, health problems, uh, getting too much iron, particularly heme iron, which is the type that's found in animal products because heme iron kind of forces its way into your body with, with non-heme iron, your body will take what it needs. And if you're exposed to too much, but you already have enough, your body will absorb a lot less of it. But with the heme iron, your body will kind of get it whether it needs it or not, which can be detrimental. Uh, iron is not heme iron, excuse me, cast iron is not heme iron, but you still kind of want to get your minerals from food mostly. The danger with the pan is you could get so much, you know, if you've ever tasted iron taste in your pan, well, that's, that's literally the pan is like sharing the wealth with you, you know, because it literally is a mineral. So if you season it well, then you're going to have less of that. And it may not be a problem. And some people love their cast iron pans. And if you have iron deficiency, then yes, cast iron could be beneficial. So back to the probiotics though. Um, you know, the, the danger with taking probiotic supplements is that it's kind of like a monocrop. You have thousands and thousands of 
bacteria, different kinds in your digestive tract. If you take like three or five and you give a huge surge of them, they can actually crowd out the biodiversity that's important to your overall health and well being. And it's the diversity that you really need. So, in general, you're better off from a probiotic standpoint eating things like sauerkraut and kimchi and fermented vegetables, maybe some miso, other fermented foods. Uh, yes, kombucha is also a, a probiotic that can have some benefits in this way. Anything that ferments sort of in the open air rather than, uh, now yogurt can have beneficial bacteria, but it's usually a few strains because it's, it's, it's uh, colonized very, very quickly. All of the plant yogurts too, they are colonized quickly. So there's one type that's inoculated in there typically, or a few types of bacteria. They can still be beneficial. Um, and there are studies showing that people who take probiotic supplements fare better. But I think that in the long run, if we get more nuanced about it, we're going to see that people who eat lots of fermented foods do better yet. Um, so, you know, tempeh too, by the way, even though you cook it, it still seems to have its fermented soy and it seems to have a lot of benefits in terms of nourishing gut health. Um, so, uh, but, but prebiotics are really great too. And that's where the fiber kicks in. So you combine that fermented foods and prebiotics, that's kind of the best thing. And then, yeah, you may do well with probiotics. Um, but there are people who can actually get overwhelmed with too much of certain bacteria that will crowd out the other ones. And that's not always to their benefit. So, um, unfortunately we just have a lot more to learn about that. And I wish I could tell you there was some probiotic pill that had like 2000 strains in it. And that was like, really good to take, but I, I can't right now because I'm not aware of any other than fermented foods. Kimchi, yes, kimchi is so good. Kimchi is so good. There's great studies on kimchi. Partly it's, you're combining spicy peppers, which are really good for you with cabbage, which is really good for you. And then you're fermenting it, which is really good for you. And it's just like, it's a superstar. Okay. Um, so one of the foods that perhaps many of the people on this Zoom eat or used to eat is white rice. And can you talk about the arsenic issue um, with the rice? And uh, Yes. <laughs> sure. So, you know, uh, there have been studies uh, done by Consumer Reports, among others, that have found that there's arsenic in our rice. Um, and it's, it's from the soils. There's organic arsenic and non-organic arsenic. So there's some that's just naturally a part of life and comes from the earth. And then there's arsenic that's coming from pesticides and factories, it's in the air, it's in the water and rice sits in a swamp. That's kind of how it grows. It grows in the water at first. And it, it seems that that swamp captures all the arsenic that happens to be in the soil in the area. And then the rice absorbs that. So whatever there is, rice is going to grab it. And so we find that um, consistently uh, rice has some arsenic contamination. Now, not a lot necessarily. I'm not, I'm not at a point where I could say don't eat rice, but I could say don't base your whole life around it. Um, and now, interestingly, uh, rice from California seems to be a little bit better based on the studies. Lundberg rice, if you're going to eat rice, seems to be the best brand. For this, but it's not nothing. They're just very, they test all their rice and they reveal those test re results publicly on their website. And so they're very accountable about this and they're trying very hard to do the best they can. Organic is better, but it's not immune because the soil hasn't necessarily always been organic. And because it's part of the water, maybe coming from far away. So, you know, we live in a world that can be polluted and contaminated, but it doesn't have some of the pesticides in it that can directly bring arsenic into food. Um, wild rice is different. Wild rice is almost a different crop. So I, I don't think it has those same concerns. Um, quinoa is great. Quinoa doesn't have that problem. So when I learned about this, we started shifting our diet towards more quinoa and less rice. You know, we also eat amaranth and uh, we eat teff. Uh, we eat buckwheat. We eat millet. There's a lot of wonderful grains. Um, and uh, but quinoa is our favorite. And by the way, a little trick here um, is that you want to soak your quinoa or at least rinse it before you cook it. But ideally with any grain, you soak it overnight and pour off the water before you cook it. And that will get rid of, in the case of rice, that'll get rid of quite a bit of the arsenic, um, but it also helps it to start sprouting. And that process of just starting that sprouting process makes a lot of the nutrients more bioavailable. Um, 
Same is true with legumes. If you can soak them sometimes for about 48 hours, pulling off the water every 12, you'll get rid of the oligosaccharides, which are one of the things that causes gas from beans. They don't have to be the musical fruit necessarily. And you will also help to start the sprouting process, which also increases uh, bioavailability and nutrient absorption. So um, yeah, soaking is wonderful before cooking for grains and beans. And what about um, as for people who are transitioning to a more plant-centered diet, what about things like Beyond Meat and Impossible uh, Meat? Do you consider those good to use in the interim or maybe not by this look on your face? <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on where you are and where you're coming from. I mean, I think that um, if you're having to choose between a Beyond Burger or Beyond Sausage and a beef burger or beef sausage, go with the Beyond one. You know, it's, it's going to be a little lower in saturated fat. It's going to be higher in fiber. And it doesn't come with all the contaminants that animal products have. And you're contributing to a healthier planet, right? So those are good things. Uh, it's a good step in the right direction, but it's a highly processed food. Impossible even more so is highly processed. And yes, they're, they're tasty and they're heavy, high in sodium, and they have saturated fat in them. And Impossible Burgers actually have heme iron. They're the only plant food, if you will, with heme iron in them because they wanted to make it bleed and sort of have that, that meat-like taste. And they, they genetically engineer it. So, um, you know, depending on your thoughts on genetic engineering, some people are a little concerned about impossible. Um, again, I think from an environmental standpoint, it's a big step in the right direction. From an ethical standpoint, well, no animals are killed in the process. From a health standpoint, it's probably a step in the right direction. Again, there's no fiber in any animal products, but there is fiber in um, Impossible Burgers and Beyond Burgers and all those other products. So, you know, it's a step forward, um, I think, um, but uh, I don't think it's the destination, you know, and if you're really serious about your health, then you want to go further than that, I think. Okay, and as we're talking about heart health, one suggestion that's often made is drinking red wine. And so what is your view on that and then alcohol in general? So alcohol in general has no nutritional value for human beings. It's kind of like sugar in that way, different, but in, in that sense, it doesn't, there's no way that alcohol is good for you as a, as a compound. It may be make you feel good if it helps you have a better social life and more love and connection. I suppose that could be good for you because love is good for you. If it helps you have less stress, I suppose that could be good for you because less stress is good for you, but it's not because of the alcohol. Those things are good for you and there are better ways to create love and connection and stress reduction that don't come with increased risk of cancer, increased risk of heart disease and other health problems, not to mention addictive problems if you consume too much. Um, if you're going to drink alcohol, and I'm certainly not going to tell you you shouldn't ever have any, even if it's not great for your health, um, then red wine is the best of the alcoholic options out there because uh, you're getting a lot of polyphenols and resveratrol, which are high in red grapes. Um, but you can also get those from red grapes or from red grape juice, which does have a lot of health benefits. So um, if you're going to drink fruit juice, by the way, red grape juice is probably about the best one out there um, uh, health-wise, again, because of the polyphenols and resveratrol. Um, but, you know, if you're going to consume alcohol, red wine, especially a glass in moderation, not a big problem. There are some studies showing people who drank a glass of wine a day were fine with that, sometimes even slightly helped health-wise, perhaps it's more because of the social dynamics that, it, that, that ensued. Perhaps it's the resveratrol. I suspect if they'd been drinking a glass of red grape juice every day, they would have had more benefit. But, you know, um, it's not something that's terrible. Yeah, there's red wine with no alcohol too. That's true. Um, and, um, you know, it's don't make the perfect the enemy of the good either though. You know, like it's a glass of red wine is not going to kill you if it doesn't mess with your ethical values and your faith. If, if you've got addiction histories in your background or in your family, that's a really good reason to stay away from any alcohol and draw a bright line. If not, a little bit now and then, not a big deal, um, but not a health food in my opinion. Okay, the and then, not. all right, so maybe like a quick lightning round. <laughs> There's some more specific questions, but 
um, I'm sure it's specific to that person, but your views on coffee. Coffee. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are studies showing, you know, people who drink five cups of coffee a day in one study had much longer life expectancy. They had lower rates of dementia and cancer. So five cups sounds like a lot to me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's what it was. That's what the study said. Uh, but, you know, is it possible that those are people who were active and they were doing a lot and they were using their brains and they were up to something in the world? And, you know, we don't know for sure, right? Um, uh, but I also know that for some people, coffee is really bad for their adrenal system and it makes them stressed out and it makes them jittery and it makes them not sleep well. So, you know, this is one of those compounds that we really are not all the same. And some people are uh, rapid metabolizers of caffeine. They metabolize it quickly and then they're done. Other people, it takes a really long time. It can be still in their system 12 hours later. And that's why some people can't drink coffee after breakfast and not have it keep them up at night, right? So listening to your own body is important. Um, some people also do well with decaf, which has about three quarters of the antioxidants that are in caffeinated coffee. The Swiss water process is the least chemical intensive way to create decaffeinated coffee. So if you are a coffee drinker and you wanna avoid the caffeine, but you like the taste of coffee and the experience, then going with Swiss water process decaf is an interesting idea. For the average American, the number one source of antioxidants in their diet is coffee. So it is high in antioxidants, but that's also because the average American's diet is so low in antioxidants. So if you're eating lots of vegetables, coffee will not be your number one source, but it still can be a very good source. And um, there's some benefits. There's also benefits from green tea. In fact, of all the caffeinated beverages, I, if I had to create a pecking order, I put green tea number one, and then I'd put black tea and coffee down from that a little bit. Um, and, uh, but you can also get great benefit from drinking, you know, decaf uh, or herbal teas. A lot of the teas have wonderful health benefits too. Um, drinking a lot in general is really good. Water is the best, um, but you can absolutely enjoy tea. And there are so many studies on the health benefits of tea. So arguably the biggest reason not to drink coffee is that you can drink more tea. And um, tea is really, really healthy. Green tea in particular. Again, though, not right before bed. So listen to your own body. See what makes sense for you. Um, but yeah, um, green tea is just loaded with uh, cancer-fighting, free radical-destroying nutrients, um, polyphenols as well. Um, really amazing. Okay, and next question. What is the best way that you suggest for cleaning fruits and vegetables? Um, so... Uh, the biggest concern with fruits and vegetables is gonna be um, uh, pesticide exposure. And that's mainly with the non-organic ones. Although organic vegetables can be sprayed with, you know, other kinds of pesticides still that are not as toxic. Um, so the way that you clean them is with a baking soda water solution. If you go to foodrevolution.org and look for, type in, you know, like washed vegetables, you can pull up a whole article we ran on this, but the punchline is this, take a tub of water and you put like per gallon of water, you put about a tablespoon of baking soda in, you mix that in, soak your fruits or vegetables in that water for about 10 minutes. Then you pull them out and rinse them a little bit and, uh, or just rinse them at all just to get the baking soda water off. And um, you've gotten rid of like 80, 90% of any pesticides that were on there just by doing that. So if you can afford to go organic, then that's the best because then you're kind of gonna have a lot less pesticides to begin with. But if you can't, then soaking in a little baking soda water solution is what the studies have shown can get off most of the pesticides that might be on there. And, um, and that's a good move. If you don't have time to soak and you can't afford organic, still eat the kale, you know? still eat the veggies. All those studies done showing that people have had health benefits from vegetables and fruits. Most of them, they were eating non-organic vegetables and fruits and they were not washing them like I just described and they'd still had huge health benefits. So do the best you can. But if you wanna get away from the pesticides, which is certainly a lovely idea, then this could help. And the veggie washes that we see sold, I'm seeing comments about that and also apple cider vinegar. Well, they may have some benefit but what the studies show is the most helpful is baking soda. And you're never gonna see it advertised and you're never gonna see it sold and pushed in stores because it's cheap. <laughs> so people can't make a lot of money off it. So Trader Joe's makes a lot more money selling their veggie wash. 
Apple cider vinegar has also been shown to be helpful in some studies, but it has a taste that not everyone likes in their fruits and vegetables, and it costs more, and it's not as effective as baking soda. Okay, so as we start to wind down on time, um, I know you wanted to discuss the Food Revolution Network and um, the different websites and resources that uh, the people on the call could go to. So I just wanna say that there are two people who actually wanna speak directly to you and share with you how you have impacted their life. So um, I'll let you do the Food Revolution announcement, Revolution announcement first, and then we'll have those, we'll bring those two on the screen. And then after that, at the end, um, I'm going to send you a private message. Um, as I was sharing with you, your book was part of our 31 day ultimate champion challenge. So I am going to message you the winners and you are going to announce the winners um, of the challenge at the end. So, um, so right now you can announce the websites and then I'll bring the two people on the screen to talk with you and then we'll announce the winners and then we will be done. <laughs> Sounds great, okay. So um, the websites are foodrevolution.org to learn about our work and to connect up with our wealth of resources. We have articles, hundreds and hundreds of articles on food and health topics, social justice, sustainability, all the dimensions of the food revolution. So go there to learn more and engage. Um, that's all free. There's also links on there to some of our other resources. Um, we have uh, foodrevolutionsummit.org. So we have the Food Revolution Summit where we interview some of the top food experts on the planet every year. Um, if you go there now, you can register and join in free to listen to interviews from our last summit. We also have our next one coming up end of April. So if you go there April, after April 1st, you can register for the 2022 one, or you can just sign up for our email list at foodrevolutionsummit.org or foodrevolution.org and then you'll be on our list. That's really what I recommend you do. And then you can uh, be notified about all of our events and programs. We're releasing new resources every few weeks now, um, and as well as new blog articles twice a week. So you get updated on all that. Um, a couple of the resources I mentioned earlier, foodrevolution.org slash complement. will tell you about that supplement that I was mentioning and foodrevolution.org slash water will give you a link to learn more about water filters and the AquaTrue. And then actually, uh, let me see, is it um, foodrevolution.org slash air doctor, is it? Let me check. Um, there, I, I, yeah, foodrevolution.org slash air doctor will take you to a discount page for the Air Doctor Pro, which is my favorite air filter. And I really think that breathing good air is really important. And a lot of us have so many toxins in our homes that we don't even realize from carpets, from chairs, from clothes, um, and not to mention bacteria and viruses. And the Air Doctor can filter that out, in including um, it's been found effective in studies with SARS-CoV-2. And so Air Doctor Pro, and if you go to foodrevolution.org slash Air Doctor, you can find out more about that. And all of those links that I just mentioned for compliment Air Doctor and Water, are um, those are all affiliate links. So we have partnerships with those folks. So if you do make a purchase from them, they'll make a contribution to support our work. And they'll also give you discounts because that's sort of what we've arranged for our members with them. So those are all some resources for you. And then of course, foodrevolution.org is our main site and foodrevolutionsummit.org. Um, and you know, I really just wanna say how grateful I am to all of you for your interest in this. It means so much to me to have this time with you. I'm so grateful for your enthusiasm, for your curiosity, for your engagement, um, and for your time here. Um, I want to make sure to say some closing words. Uh, are we going to have everybody with us for these last couple of pieces? Yes. Um, OK, great. Then I'll say a little closing at the very, very end then. Okay. All right, so I'm introducing you to one of our awesome HeartSmarts ambassadors, uh, Donna Felix Mility. She's going to unmute. Hello, Mr. Robbins. I loved your book. The format, its format, the personal interjections. I see, it seems like I know about Brody River, Phoenix. I love your date nights, all of these. <laughs> The book was a wonderful 
like guide for any individual and i did like um the eat better stress less um the love moving the physical stuff so it was like even though we've read we've had um all these different books that we've read i loved your format in that not that i didn't get a lot of information from the other books but i loved your format in that you had your action plans at the end of everything so i could always go back to the end of each um area and look at the action plans and I love that you brought in the spiritual aspect, the gathering aspect. You don't usually get that when you're talking about health. So that aspect, and before this, I can see your personality jumping out of the pages, but then to see you tonight, you're so passionate and it gives like a different energy as to needing to do the writing with my health and to encourage others. So thank you for what you have done. Dr. Teddy, I did it in a short while. Okay? <laughs> I was no, Thank you. So much. All right, bless <laughs> okay. Um, what did I do? Right. Okay, so next, um, let me remove her. Uh, wait. Okay, one second. Right. Um, so next, I'm going to bring on um, Sister Beverly Bruin. Um, all right. And unmute. Okay. Are you able to unmute? I think so. Did I unmute? Yes. Okay. Great. Hi. Um, I am so excited. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to throw a couple of comments at you. First of all, I think who, I don't know who created the cover for your book. It is absolutely gorgeous. It is so vibrant. Just looking at the fruits and vegetables, it makes you want to read the book. So I just wanted to comment on that and thank you for the, the beautiful jacket, just the whole book. Um, I just, uh, Sister Donna said some of what I wanted to say, so I won't repeat her, but the manner in which this book is personalized is absolutely phenomenal. It has such a different approach than many of the other books that we read. I love the fact that you just covered everything and she mentioned about the spiritual piece. It was so easy to read. It's so relatable, like you wanted to pick up the chapter. We did a chapter every um, week, which was really wonderful. So you could take time. My book is so marked up with highlighters. It's not funny, like a Bible. So I could just keep flipping through it, which I've been doing. Um, but one of, the, one of the most important things that I wanted to say to you is that I'm a survivor of a massive heart attack. Mm. And I have been journeying for some time now, teaching as an ambassador. I've made a lot of changes, but I'm just at a place right now in my life coming into this year where I just really wanted to own this, the whole plant-based um, living, the whole food aspect of things and just really take it on and do it. I got sick in January when we started our challenge, very sick. And so I wasn't able to keep up like I could have before, but I'm much better now. And as I moved into February, I decided I wanted to take my own personal journey to repeat January in a way that I kind of missed out. So I've started really be my own revolution as you would, the way you put it in the book. So I'm moving now towards my second week, no meat, totally no oil, totally no dairy, working with creating new recipes. And I'm just so excited. And this book has really helped to be the catalyst to push me forward. And I just wanna thank you for writing this book. It was perfect timing in my life to read it. And I'm just looking forward to reversing this um, heart disease situation. We've talked a lot about should you do this and should you do that? And what I've come to realize is if you have any real major illness like heart disease, and I wanted to encourage anybody else, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, any of those type of challenges, it's worth it to me to take the chance. You won't know until you take the chance. So it's worth it to take the chance to give the plant-based 
diet, the whole food aspect of how to approach the oil, giving up the dairy, giving up the meat and see what it's going to do for you. You'll never know until you try it. So I'm sold out at this point and I'm giving it my best. And I want to really thank you for the encouragement of this book and that I can continue to work, refer to it while I'm on my journey. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here. I really do. Awesome. Thank you, Sister Beverly. Thank you, Sister Beverly. All right. So the moment we've all been waiting for besides waiting for ocean. <laughs> so this is the other moment um, we've all been waiting for. So um, Ocean, to give you some context, so with the Heart Smarts program in the colder months when we can't be outside um, walking and exercising, we have monthly challenges that keep people active, keep them eating healthy, really focused on their health goals. And in January, I kind of went a bit extreme <laughs> and um, created the Heart Smarts Ultimate Champion Challenge. And so participants had to walk a certain amount of steps per day and um, eat their service of fruits and vegetables, do a lot of strength training and things like that. So I am going to send you the list of winners and you can read it exactly as it's um, stated there. So I think I've got it. You sent it to me earlier. Did I? Oh, yes. I emailed. Okay. <laughs> so do you want me to go? I can go over You can this. use so, the yeah. one in the chat. The one in the chat is better. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. So. The team winner is Cindy's Heart Team One. Yes. <laughs> the ambassador winner is Cindy Mason. <laughs> the individual winners are, and forgive me if I mispronounce any names, okay? I'll do my best. Yetka Carlisle. Colleen Wright, Sonia Griffith, Paulus Charles, Cindy Mason again, Mona Reynolds, Donna Felix Melidi, Arlene Small, Shirlene Mascal or Mascal, and Paulette Crawford. Okay, so I am going to just unmute everyone for two seconds for the applause for all of the winners. Uh, so. right. Okay, congratulations. 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 Okay, <laughs> so we want to respect um, Ocean's time. So after um, Ocean leaves us, we can reconvene and really talk to the winners um, of the challenge. But Ocean, thank you so much for being here tonight. You've been so gracious with your time. When you told me 90 minutes, I said, okay, wow. I didn't expect um, you to even offer so much. And so we're really grateful to you for writing this book. And the way the book even came into um, my life was we finished reading The Pleasure Trap. And um, I was listening to it on, on Audible and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in January. And I was like, I need some kind of 31 day journal, 31 day something, and I couldn't find anything. And Amazon recommended your book. And I was like, you've gotta be kidding me. And it was 31 days that we could use in January. So it was perfect um, timing, how it came up, what it came up for. Um, so it has been a pleasure reading the book. And I'm actually gonna read it again because I feel like it's one of those books, each time you read it, you're going to see and learn something different. So we really appreciate you. We are all going to become part of the Food Revolution Network. And in any ways that we can work with you in the future, we would love to do so. So thank you so much um, for being here tonight. Oh, I have to unmute you. It's been such a pleasure to be with all of you. And I just, again, thank you for your attention and for caring about your health and your food and your world. And I just, I'm so grateful um, to have this time with all of you. And um, really, you know, as you can probably kind of tell, I'm passionate about this stuff. And, you know, the food revolution is kind of my life's work. And so you're all part of that now, now that you know, <laughs> you're part of the revolution. And 
uh, you can spread the word and you can inspire other people through your example and through sharing the wisdom that you glean. And um, together we will uplift lives, we will save lives and we'll help to heal communities. So I, I thank you for all of it. And I look forward to doing more with all of you. Bless you, thank you. Thank you. Well, let us give you a round of applause uh, for being here with us this evening. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.